I was once interviewing Kenneth Branagh, and he said something very interesting. Is why you know he had done a very successful movie, you know, Henry V, and he was getting offered of all things war scripts and stuff. But the thing, and a lot of things. But uh, the thing that attracted him to the movie Dead Again was he he opened it and he couldn't tell from page one to page three where it was going. He had no clue. And I'm just wondering, as writers, is that is that kind of a mark of passion when you're sticking with it, even though you don't know where it's going? Do you have that experience? Um. I love having that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gets, I would yeah. like to have that experience, but more often than not, I don't. I've read a lot of scripts where I don't know where it's going, and neither neither did they. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what it is is like you're willing to go down the rabbit hole if you're really confident that they know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. as long as you know, you've got the first couple pages like you know, trust me, I, I, I this is going to be good, and then you'll go along, and um, and people will follow you through, you know. 60 pages of things could, things are kind of confusing as long as they believe that you're going to have the answers for them at the other side. Yeah. Well, and I think I think it's kind of a, a um, what do they call that? Uh, because of what we do, it's really hard to read a script or, or see a movie where you're not kind of thinking three scenes ahead and you're like, oh, they're going to do this probably, or they're going to do that. And so when I Whenever I can read a script or see a film, and I can't tell where it's going, but I, but as you said, John, you have that confident feeling that okay, they know what they're doing. Yeah. I hope yeah. um, those are my favorite movies yeah. because it's no fun, you know, going like, oh, it's going to be the guy in the gray hat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's just that's not a fun experience. Yeah. There was a question over here. Uh, uh, yours was it you, sir? Uh, Answered. Uh, yeah. I just had a, a quick question for John about Corpse Bride. Uh, one of the last things you said was about um, when you read it, the script that, that when you came on, that you thought it was a musical. Like, what was it about it that made you make that decision? Um, there were things that, there were emotions that needed to be conveyed that really weren't going to happen in dialogue. And like, and the musicals are, of course, like you know, when words fail you, then you start to sing. And there, I, as I read through it, like there's many moments where like, okay, that is a song, and it's not a song right now. And so, um, the first thing I wrote for it was according to plan, which is basically all about the wedding. And it just took the place of like a lot of dialogue about the wedding, that was just not interesting. Um, and so. It also felt like a musical in the sense of like I need to be able to cut quickly between a lot of different things, and so it was going to be music no matter what. And a song felt right for the world. Um, you know, Victor felt like you know the heartbroken poet um, who played the piano, so like to his singing felt really natural. And you were going to this whole other different world, which felt sort of boisterous and alive, and people would sing down there too. So, you know, I was able to convince Tim that like I know you don't. I know he didn't want it to be a musical, but it really wants to be a musical. And I showed him the songs, and he he signed off. Um, and I should say, like the, the songwriting process for the movies I've done, um, like Big Fish has a song, Charlie and Chocolate Factory has a bunch of songs, Corpse Bride has songs. Um, I write the lyrics, I write um, the melody in my head. Um, I give Danny the lyrics, I don't tell him the melody, and he makes up his own thing. And uh, it's this really weird th thing where like, you know, the song is completely different to me than it is to him, but it somehow worked out. And so Rodgers and Hammerstein did it too. Yeah, they did, okay, yeah. And so it's like, you know, I, I have music in my head, but I, I never actually communicate that through to him. Your question, sir. Is story important to you guys, or <laughs> what? Hell you don't. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. It is to us. When we're, you know, when you're work, I haven't worked on a movie yet where the people who were making it weren't fairly seriously trying to make a good movie, and a whole bunch of them are crap. You know, but. The people involved in it, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, the people who bother to talk to me, you know, I'm sure there's a guy up there who doesn't give a damn, um, care, you know, and they are trying to make the story. Sometimes they're just not good at it. Um, sometimes the story shouldn't be made, I guess. Um, and other times there's just a big old money driver behind it doesn't need a story. Um, but... Yeah, well, I, the story. Yeah, I like the story. <laughs> I, I think we all kind of secretly, maybe not so secretly, as writers, um, hate movies that are very successful and really awful yeah. because it's kind of like, oh man, you know, uh, the, the the story characters. It's kind of what 
we all love and and it's 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 uh it's it's disheartening because you can't go then to you know when you see a, a really bad film that costs a lot of money and makes none yeah. you can go to those guys and you can say this is why your movie failed what do you do when you go in and it's like it made a gazillion dollars and it's horrible how do you how do you convince them that it's worth investing time and money in story and characters it's a bit disheartening you know i think it, it's getting harder i feel like it's harder to tell a good story just because of because audiences are so familiar with uh especially genre tropes and um and actually, that's what I like about both these genres: is it gives you a chance to 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 tell a story from a uh, from a from another angle. I mean, you think of a movie like uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which technically is science yeah. fiction, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what what that uh, conceit allows him to do is tell us a love story, right? And let us see it from a new angle, and, and uh, you know through a prism we haven't seen it before and experience it in a fresh way. Right. And ideally that's what um, what a genre piece, uh, a science fiction or a fantasy piece can, can do. So I'm really interested in finding those sorts of prisms that let you re-experience a familiar story in, in, in a new way. Right. Well, I think to a no, certain extent, not to raise the old special effects are bad, flag because they're not but um stories don't need to be as cleverly told as they once did because everything can be made and put in front of you it's like the the classic example is the the red barrels in jaws you know i mean the yellow barrels are 100 percent more terrifying than the shark when they get sucked down like that and they're only there because the shark broke now the shark will never break and you'll never get the yellow barrels and so it's always right in your face you know there's no you don't need to build suspense anymore because you can whack somebody on the head with a giant robot um but isn't there the that shark movie that was that came out a few years ago i think it was rennie harlan directed it was the the one where it's uh, uh, huh deep blue sea, deep blue sea. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. now there, there you got sharks galore but the movie didn't didn't spellbind because right. it, it couldn't intrigue and maybe the special effects might back up on themselves in a bit yeah well i think i mean not that they didn't make money but nobody likes them the, the first star wars are better Mm -hmm. You know, when you can do anything you want, it's probably boring. Well, this gentleman's question speaks very well to something that you were saying before, John, about when you're creating a script, and this is something that you all, I think, were in agreement about, which is that when you get a script going, there's the danger of getting too much into the world you're creating and, and losing sight of the characters, and it may be simply that what's happened, and I, I haven't seen Transformers 2, Transformers 1 did it, it was f fine enough for me, but the, the thing is, it's like you get so, the filmmakers have the, that sort of rapture of the heights where they've, they've created this world that they're into, and maybe for the first time the audience is into it, but but it won't sustain beyond that first viewing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if you could just speak I mean, to that the, a little. The, the frustration of a screenwriter is that a novelist, anything he makes, is that he writes the words, the words that you buy at the bookstore, and that book are his words. And it's very hard to tell on a blockbuster like Transformers what did Kurtzman and Orsi, the talented screenwriters, write versus what did Michael Bay put on screen. And um, you know, I'm not here to just, just to slam Michael Bay, but there's uh, stories. You're not, you're not, not to though, right? Yeah, <laughs> but story. I, I I feel safe saying that like you know, story is not his number one concern, mm. or at least you know, his uh, conception of story wouldn't be my conception of story, and would probably not be a lot of other people's conception of what story is, moment by moment by moment. And um, he does big robots fighting really well, and that's. And if, so if you're going to see a big robot movie fighting, that's that's what you're going to get. Um, what I said before about being a stock picker is that, like, you know, I'm going to try to figure out who I'm going to work with and who I'm going to trust and who I'm going to actually think is going to make the movie that I want to make, too. And so, like, you end up sort of, if you can find a filmmaker that you'd like to work with, that's why I'm making movies with Tim Burton and hopefully until we're both dead, um, is that we get each other and, like, you know, I, I know what's going to be interesting to Tim and I know he's not going to flip out and, like, you know, and and do something completely different to the movie than, than I would want to do. Um, so, you know, the novelist gets to work alone. The screenwriter has to trust a whole bunch of people years down the road to make the same movie that he set out to make. 
The question over here, yeah, yes, yours. I had a conversation recently with an agent who said, at least, and he, we were talking about spec scripts, and it was a science fiction script, but it may not be limited to that genre. He was saying that what studios are looking for are concepts that, you know, he was suggesting not to have too much character. That basically is the concept and kind of shoehorn in the character when you can. Hmm. And if that's the case, and maybe the case, is there any guidelines, or overall guidelines you have on the, approaching that or balancing that? Well, I think the question is, are you trying to sell yourself as a writer or are you trying to sell that script? You know, Because, yeah, when they want to buy the script, they'll buy the concept no matter how badly it's written because they'll hire you know, somebody in this room. I'll get a different agent. So. Yeah, that's, I think it's really yeah. bad advice. Yeah. Really bad advice. I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, screw Screenwriting is, is the career of writing a bunch of movies, um, not selling an idea, and it's not a lottery. So it's not like you're going to like buy the one ticket that's going to... Well, in this case, he loves the concept that I had. He was just saying to trim away a lot of the character. And I think well, maybe make it more efficient. I'm not saying yeah, he's it, wrong. It, 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 your script may be overwritten, and there may be too much. I mean, we haven't read it, but um, I wouldn't say as a general rule to sort of like, oh, take away plot and character out of your, out of your spec. Uh, that's not a... Well, what it struck me is what he was guiding and what I've seen a lot of, it seems like you get an interesting, and there are a lot of films that are being made and written, that there's an interesting concept and then it turns into a conspiracy, some government, someone's chasing this guy, someone's trying to kill the guy, the try, guy's trying to stay alive throughout the story. And it seems like it's almost, there's a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, I'm torn. Because some of the movies I hold very close to my heart that I haven't written are the simplest ones. You know, they're not. Like, and they might not even be good. Um, Name a couple. Well, I, okay. The other day, I was watching The First Predator. And there is essentially nothing to that movie but, you know, guy, monster, and some extra people who are going to get killed. Um, and if they had put in anything more, which undoubtedly... Someone would feel compelled to, like, you know, put a government conspiracy in there about, you know, they're trying to do this or, you know. I just want to see that guy and that guy try to kill each other for two hours. But you know what? Um, I think that that might be the perfect movie. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I'm quite serious. It, it's, 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 uh, it's got conflict. Mm -hmm. It's easy to understand. It's simple. And, uh, and then there are clever twists and turns. Um, and it has the line, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Yeah. <laughs> I will never yeah. write that. <laughs> <laughs> There's questions over this way. Do we have the mic? Uh, just lady in uh, black first, and then we'll just sort of move. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about how, uh, what your first real professional assignment was or sale. Uh, first thing I was hired to write was How to Eat Fried Worms, which is an adaptation of a kid's book about a kid who makes a bet to eat 15 worms in 15 days. Uh, my samples for that were uh, the novelization of Natural Born Killers that I wrote and um, <laughs> a romantic tragedy set in Colorado. So I, I just wanted to say, like, you know, the genre is a little bit irrelevant. I mean, I think they were both well written and that ended up getting me the job for those. And uh, so I did How to Eat Fried Worms, I did Wrinkle in Time. Neither of which really got made in sort of the, the way I, I'd written them, and uh, Go was the first thing I got produced. Uh, my my first job was Contact actually, though uh, at that point, and uh, this was a number of years before it actually got made. Um, it was a uh, moribund project that had been sort of you know stewing in development for twenty years, and and uh, and I was cheap and. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I guess I was. I guess I, I picked a good stock in that case. I got I got lucky. I just want to go back to this guy for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Why that really that really disturbs me that advice? Because why does a good idea preclude characters you care about? Um, I mean, I can't think of. I, was on, I mean, even Predator. Mm. You yeah, know, you I care. mean, yeah, you care. Yes, I mean, it's in an archetypal sort of way. You know, you project yourself into, and. I actually think that's the secret. Uh, the secret weapon of genre writing is is really good character work. Is is if among the spec the you know the spectacle and the set pieces and all, you you have 
people we can relate to and really care about, and they're, uh, to a degree we're not expecting to. Well, how does that not make uh, the mm -hmm. movie better? You know, and I would I would argue like the Pixar films are great examples of that. Great ideas, brilliant ideas, um, but executed and w w from the p from the uh, as character driven pieces, and we fall in love with those characters. And I think that's why they're going to endure, not because they're gorgeous, which they are, but because they move us. So. Uh, yeah. um, our first paying gig was writing a movie that I would still secretly like to get made about the murder in the silent movie theater over, over on Fairfax. Um, and we got it. Well, we'd written a spec that was good. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Well, we'd written a spec that was terrible where we tried to do everything wrong. Well, we, we tried to do everything the way we thought people would want it to be. Basically, we wrote a, a thriller that, you know, oh, thrillers have this, and thrillers have this. Um, and it was the least thrilling thing ever. Um, so, and in it, like halfway through it, we started making fun of it and making jokes, and we'd write them and cut them out. And so the next time, we were like, well, everything we cut out, we're going to leave in. And that was the spec that actually eventually got made. Um, but that got us our first paying job. And we weren't in the guild, which is probably why we got the job, because they could pay us next to nothing. Um, so there is occasionally an advantage to not being in the guild. No, I'm going to get struck by lightning now. Oh, uh, uh, the uh, the f uh, first thing I worked on that ever got made actually was uh, Terminator 1, uh, the Terminator, and which I, I didn't fully co-write, but I, I wrote a bunch of scenes, uh, and we kind of talked it all out together. Uh, the, 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 th the next thing that, that I, I did myself was, uh, an NBC, uh, TV movie called Desperado Outlaw Wars. It was part of a trilogy of rotating 90-minute, um, things with, uh, the guy from the Madonna video. <laughs> but that's how we got discovered. I can't remember. I, it was a long time ago. I can't remember the uh, fellow's name. Wonderful actor. And uh, nice guy. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was it. It was another genre piece, a, w a Western. Can I ask, did, did you or Cameron write the line, come with me if you want to live? Yes. Um, I'm trying to, th you know, I, I've been asked that a lot. The, the, uh, there was so much back and forth stuff oh. that we, w I'll just give it to him. Um, He's not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who wrote, I'll be back? <laughs> uh, I, I ended up writing that one, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but again, it was all kind of, uh, um, well, you guys must deal with this all the time. Which one of you wrote that line for that? Me. Yeah. <laughs> then I rewrote it. You did the. You did the. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's just. It's a really tough question to answer. Not because I'm trying to be shy, but when you're working with somebody else, yeah. saying who wrote what becomes kind of meaningless at a point because you toss it back and forth four or five times and change three words and then okay, who did what? And it's just. It's it, not. Not to mention that it's kind of hard to remember sometimes because it's two o'clock in the morning and you're both exhausted. Mm. Yeah. There were a couple more questions over here, and then I'm going to roll back here, just to, so so don't despair. <laughs> yes, uh, the next hand that's up. I was just wondering, since um, most of you did movie adaptions of books, how many times would you say you read the book before you grasped like the characters and the plot, and then started writing the movie script? Um, weirdly, that first reading is the most crucial reading because that's where you're sort of like you're, you're filtering through and it's like this is this is how it becomes a two-hour movie. This is how it moves forward at 24 frames a second. Um, so I remember like reading the manuscript for Big Fish that had been published yet. I'm turning pages and I'm like, and he's gonna have a French wife and like the character didn't exist and like you know he's living in Paris and he's a journalist like it's all new stuff and it was happening as I was reading through it the first time and you're moving stuff around. Um, like Big Fish, I probably only really read three times, and I know that sounds wrong, but like the movie that's in my head is 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 different than the the book that's there. Charlie and Chocolate Factory, I read so much that I knew every word ahead of time. Um, this thing Preacher I'm reading right now, it's a thousand pages, really. I mean, if you go through all the issues, um, so it's important that I read it really carefully once. But I'm not going to 
pour through every last little thing. And if there's something I need to remember, I'll figure out where that was and look at it again. But um, there's not that sense of like, you can't sort of rip out the pages and feed them into the into the, the projector as much as you'd want to. Um, how about Harry Potter's huge book? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I agree completely. That first read is is a really precious thing because that's that's the closest you're going to get to an audience's experience of your movie till it comes out. So, um, so I actually I I mark up a lot for for a for a first read and. Um, so it's like, oh, that's got to go, and, and so ideas will come to you, and and so that 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 first read is critical, and and so much it's about sort of the chemistry between the book and you, and it's this because you know, Harry Potter is a 900-page book. There's a million movies. I mean, there's a different movie, and everybody's had who read it. So for me, it's what spoke to me. What you know, I presume they 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 hired me for a reason so I went with my instincts and what what spoke to me and sort of teased that story out of it um, but uh, it's a completely instinctive thing and then I probably read it less than you'd think um, you know a couple times over the course of the uh, I go back and refer to it quite a bit um, like would you get stuck sometimes and think okay just a second let's get back to grounds you know to the original and just see what's what and um, you know, uh, yes. Yeah, some well, ki kind of towards yeah, towards the end sometimes. But I think you have to step away from it. You have to internalize it and sort of make it your own and your and and your own story um, uh, in order for it to be a, a, a consistent, co cohesive thing. And um, and that's something that's really odd to go back after if you have you've been away for a while. Oh my God! So. Yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you something about Harry Potter. If you, you, it's a nine hundred and something page. It's it's only eight hundred and so many pages longer than you need it to be. <laughs> uh, I mean, did that scare you, or was that? I mean, how did you how did you did you even think about that? Uh, it's it scared me before I read it. Uh, cause it's a, it's a, but um, but once I started reading it, it quickly became clear that there actually isn't. That much more narrative um, than than any of the other books or any con conventional story. There's a lot of embellishment and detail and you know wonderful digressions, but but in terms of plot, it was uh, it was very easy to, to. I mean, that first read, I I had my structure and it never really changed. You know, David Lean said something very interesting about adapting Oliver Twist back in the 40s because it, you know he'd grown up with that book. He had a great feeling for it, and it was. But it was like, how do you take this, you know, 400-page whopper and, and distill it into a two-hour movie? And he was working with a writer, and they, they, they came up with a strategy which was simply that, okay, set the book aside. Just remember everything you can that, that maybe I could film. Just let's just make a list of, of everything that feels like it's in a movie, and and just see where we wind up. And they found themselves almost with like a clothesline of stuff that actually told the book. And I'm wondering, does that speak to any of your methods in we, terms we've, of? We've we've done something similar to that. Yeah, I mean, we did a. Um a uh, biopic uh, called *The Life and Death of Peter Sellers*, and so he has an entire, you know, there's, there's a wealth of information, and there are any number of people and little incidents and movies that you have to talk about, and um, and you can't, you know, you can't do justice to the to this man's life in anybody's life in in two hours. But you got to do something. So we would every, uh, Chris and I each read it and made crazy notes about anything halfway interesting. Anything. It could be a line. It could be a, a an image. It could be the incident of the whatever. It could be that movie which no one saw but is really hilarious and maybe we could tell everyone about it. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and we just it, it made these big lists and then we sat next to each other and went, all right, what's on both lists? You know. Hmm. And then and, and sometimes we'd have to like, well, this should be on the list. And, yeah. What are you crazy? And then and then we made cards for the for everyone that made the cut, and put them all over the living room floor, and said. You know, is there? What do these have in common? Which double up? You know, yeah. I mean, which occupy the same space in his life? And well, we're gonna have to pick one because we can't. What would be good next to each other? Yeah. And so, you know, we knew generally how his life went, and these are some ways that we could illustrate certain parts of it. It seems to be resonating with you, John. If I'm reading you right. Yeah, absolutely. You're you're looking through like what are the sort of the the key moments that 
you know, feel like they are part of your movie. And you gather those together, and that becomes the, the material you're taking for your movie. So you're not trying to sort of, how do I distill everything down, which is a dangerous way to, you're not trying to rush through things. You're saying, like, how do I tell the, how do I grab the best things and make a movie out of those? There was a question back here. Uh, your question very in the very back against the wall there. Yes. Hi. Could you give a solid definition for set piece, please? Um, a, a set piece is a is a dance number. It's a song. It's it's a block of it's a block of the movie that sort of has a beginning and end that um, something kicks it off and something and something finishes it up and um, hopefully the character has. Um, whatever's happened during that set piece has changed the world or changed the character in a way that you couldn't move back to an earlier. Is it fair to say a fight scene or a love uh, scene? I would, mm -hmm. I would say car crash. the car chase is a the set car piece. Chase is a set yeah. piece. The gunfight is a set piece. Yeah. You know, stuff, that, that kind of thing. You, you know them when you see them, and, and you know, and it's, it's kind of like a thing it's almost expected. You've got to have one of those. Yeah. Go to Indiana Jones. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. There's the one with the rolling ball. And then you just keep going. Oh, down, 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 down. Snakes in a plane, even, yeah. Uh, was it, did you have a question in the beret there next? Or, or? I, I just wanted to make sure, because Indiana Jones' set pieces generally have a lot to do with the set. Are you saying, by definition, it really oh. doesn't have anything to do with no, the set? I, no, I, no, I, no, I don't no, think no, that no. means anything to do with the set. Um, and I, we should look up, some, someone on the iPhone is going to look up on Wikipedia where, where the term set piece actually comes from. But as we use it, it means it's a block or a sequence um, that does a thing. So it's an action set piece. It's a mm -hmm. dance number. It's a song. It's a, it's a thing that you could sort of pull off and say, like, this is a little, p this is a piece of the movie. This thing holds together as one. No. You In know, a way, it I might have, st oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. No, I just, they seem more visual to me than the rest of the movie. They're all, you know, in a way they could, uh, have no dialogue in the way that I think of them in a way that's sort of, we've stopped talking and now this is going to happen and yeah, then we're going to talk the about it afterwards. The bad ones particularly are, yeah. if they're interchangeable, they're probably bad. You know, and that happens all the time. And and sometimes uh, movies start from that place and that's not a good sign. You know, I mean, we had an agent a long time ago that said, all right, what I'd like you to do is write a spec script that's got five set pieces. Uh, and and it, I mean, it started completely artificially. And it's going to still be artificial. I mean, because particularly in, say, summer action blockbuster movies, Star Trek, I love this movie. It's a great movie this summer. The, the the whole set piece where they're bungee jump, they're, they jump out of the plane and they have the fight on the on the platform, and then they get, that's a set piece. It's also a really good set piece um, because you get it. There's some good character stuff in there. Sulu goes crazy. It's I mean it's it's <laughs> pretty great, right? But that's a great example of a, you know. Uh, they had a board at one point that said, all right, the part where they fall out of the plane set piece. You know, yeah. they always knew that was going to be on page 40 or something. You know, one of the, my favorite things to do, you, and you kind of encountered them. By the way, I was just going to suggest, I wonder if it was uh, back in the oldie, olden times, it was, they, well, we have to build a set like the saloon for mm -hmm. the fight scene. I wonder well, if it I was thinking the police, the police station in Terminator. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, that's a set piece. Yep. And it's yeah. like, you're... You're destroying that set, but I mean, but I don't think that's probably where. It really, I don't think that's really where it came from. But a really fun thing to do with them, if you can, is is jam them full of exponential uh, uh, dialogue, ex exposition, because if expo exposition, if it's short and fast and 90 miles an hour with guns going off, yeah. is you really fly through it quickly, and you kind of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> What's challenging, I would say, about writing the kinds of movies that have set pieces, writing a Charlie's Angels, is that. Um, suddenly the set pieces will change, and it's like, oh, we can't do that, but we can do this. Or like, I remember on the second Charlie, I don't know, this is the first Charlie's. Um, there used to be a whole sequence which um, involved a minivan and uh, a toboggan run, and it was really, really fun. Um, but we went in like five o'clock on a Friday night, and Amy Pascal said we are cutting ten million dollars out of this movie right now, and I'm going to grab pages, I'm going to rip them, and whatever I rip out, you're going to have to fix. And, she, she, and that, that was so, partly what came out. And so the thing you have to remember about a set piece is they tend to be expensive moments in a movie, and they, mm. they tend to change based on sort of things that you don't have control of. So you're absolutely right that you need to make sure that that set piece feels like it has to be in your movie, but at the same time, that set piece will probably change 13 times over the course of things, and you're going to end up taking what would have happened there and put it in this new thing. I mean, the Charlie's Angels are, you know, 13 set pieces sort of put together, and like they always changed. But what had to happen in the, the course of those, the story that had to be told in those set pieces had to remain 
intact somehow. I, th I think that's one of the reasons they're so hard to write is that in a way they're sort of suspending the narrative. You're, or, mm -hmm. you're, or you're, you're, you're spending a chunk of time to answer one narrative question, which is, you know, in a chase scene, is he going to catch yeah. him or not? In a fight scene, who's going to win? And you have a lot of reversals going back yeah. and forth. Oh, he's, he's going to, he's not, he, yes, he, but it's the same question and it really comes down to pure invention. How, you know, how clever or original can you be in, in, uh, uh, with your moves, but 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 in a way the story stops for a set piece. Yeah, but, yeah, but also set pieces do, are iconic to the movies, though. I mean, like the you know, the Dark Knight, um, like that sequence where they grab the guy um, from Hong Kong and they have the the plane, the balloon, and all that. That's a really amazing set piece. Is it really necessary? No. There's like a, a much simpler ways you could do it, but the scale of that movie wanted to have something really big there. The toboggan. The toboggan on, on the side. It was funny. It was a, it was a thing to put together. Um, so that's a challenge too. In terms of more character-driven structure, I'm wondering if there isn't a certain application here too, because Stanley Kubrick, when working with writers, I think it was Michael Hare who pointed it out, that Stanley Kubrick would speak, he said, there was, there were at least five, maybe six non-submersible pieces in a movie. Mm. It, and it was an interesting expression, and it just meant like, it's like five mountains that you gotta touch on, and everything else is up for grabs. You can, mm, yeah. you know, you can submerge the rest of it, but there's gotta be those, we gotta decide what those are. I mean, we'll find them, but that's, is, does yeah. that sing well, to how you guys work? Yeah, well, out? I mean, sometimes they're helpful in that it's a thing you're going to work, work toward, you know? It's, it's a goal that allows you not to wander all over the place it's to a get milestone. there. It's a milestone. You you hit that thing. So Maybe that you know. Captain America's got to fight a bad guy at the end of the movie. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> oh, great! Spoiler! Yeah. Spoiler! Yeah. Spoiler. <laughs> Be on the internet tomorrow. <laughs> you want to you want to push towards that? <laughs> there was a question down in here. Yes, your question in the ball cap there. And then we'll move over to you over here. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Um, really quick question. I noticed with science fiction, because you're building worlds and there's lots of cool stuff going on there, it's easy to sort of get disoriented with your plot a lot of the time. So how do you make sure you stay on track? And I also remember Bill Wisher, I um, listened to the audio commentary on Terminator 2 once, mm -hmm. and you talked about how you brainstormed the story with James Cameron. At one point you just said it fell into place when you figured out it was about a boy and his Terminator, you know, John Connor and the T-800. So, you know, maybe especially your experience with sort of making it all fall in place. Terminators of endearment. <laughs> <laughs> a boy and his Terminator. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm not sure how to, I, I feel bad, I'm not sure really how to answer that question. I think you just did. That that you, you kind of, uh, you know, when you're lucky enough to work with a, a partner like, like you guys, two brains um, makes everything go a lot quicker. So if you can collaborate with someone that, that you trust, no, it, it really well, does. Hope, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, when, it, when you're kind of talking about what it should be and you think, oh, it's this, it, at some point, uh, you know, you you should. It, it should occur to you what it's really about. And now, it wasn't really just about a boy and his his Terminator, but it was kind of a shortcut way of of. Um, uh, it, was, it, it, was, it, was, it was a fractured family thing. I mean, for me, it came together when the three of them were in the car, and you've got Sarah and, and, and uh, Linda Hamilton and Arnold, you know, and then John Connor and back, and that's a family. It's a weird family. <laughs> you know, the mom's psychotic, he's a robot killer from the future, and, you know, and the kid's, uh, you know, uh, from foster care. But to me, that, that's really what, it's like, this is a family film, you know, at the end of the day. And, and uh, so there were certain things that kind of came out of that, I think, for us, for me. The gentleman in the blue shirt there, is there a microphone? And then, next to him, do you have a question as well? Yeah. Um, this is kind of from more from the point of view when working on kind of original story and spec script and that, but also kind of leans then towards T2 in a, in a sense, uh, in a second part. How much of when you begin, like, is I've got a great story, or, and it was touched on at the beginning, the idea of kind of cloaking a moral or a theme and a message in a, you know, an easy to sell to an audience package. Um, and the second part being, I read a, I think it was Sight and Sound article on T2 that claimed it was, you know, entirely 
uh, an allegory for the first Gulf War, and you know, Arnie was the smart bomb, and this, that, and the other, and how much no. of that resonates, and how much, <laughs> how much does it amuse you when you read those? That kind of stuff is is a, is amusing, and you know what? I mean, it, it, fair enough. Once once you make it, and you kind of, you know, turn it over to everybody else. What anybody wants to see in it. Is is fair game? I can I can guarantee you that we weren't having those discussions. It's like, oh yeah, we really want to do a movie about the Gulf War. Uh, that just wasn't part of it. Um, Took years to develop anyway, right? I mean, you were you were several years out before the war. Uh, no, actually. Well, if you're talking about T2, T2, yeah. T2 happened really quick. Oh. Um, T1 was in, back in 84, that came out in 84, and we never knew if there was going to be a sequel. And we actually, it, uh, he and I were getting ready to do an, another thing. That's happened to me a couple times in my career. <laughs> and um, he called me up and he said, you know, uh, good news and bad news, we, we can't do the thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he goes, and the good news is, you know, Andy and Mario got the rights together at, at Carolco and we're going to do T2. Let's do that. You want to do that? And I said, yeah, because we thought about it over the years. And it was like, good. Um, the, here's some more bad news. We're behind schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually turned that script out in six and a half weeks, the oh. first draft. Wow. And it was it was it was that, but you know we'd had seven years to kind of play racquetball and go what if and, and sort of get rid of a lot of the really bad ideas and and um, you know but but that's yeah no it came together very quickly. We are not playing enough racquetball. <laughs> Uh, your question about theme, though, is a, uh, is a good one, I think. Um, I think it's different for for different people. For me, that's a really useful and important organizing principle for me. Um, and often, I don't... I, I think it's dangerous to start with a theme in mind, and trying to dramatize a theme is is, uh, is pretty deadly. But usually by the time I finish a draft, I have a, a sense of what it's about and when I'm going back and trying to refine and uh, you know what is that thing I'm aiming towards not not just narratively but what does it mean what is this about you know why, why are we why are we here um, do you think you find theme more in the rewriting I do absolutely I yeah I, and at least for me if I know what the theme is going in it's it's kind of stillborn so. yeah. what's creepy is when you find the theme Reoccurring in more than one movie that you're writing, and it may turn out that it's it's your theme, not the movie's <laughs> theme, and then you're like, I'm um, just weird. To me, that that, that initial sort of conception is, uh, you know, can, do I know what the trailer is like? Um, which sounds really gross and commercial, but it's like, do I have a sense of what the movie feels like, and sort of how you would distill this movie down and what it actually feels like? And because a movie is. It's the characters and it's the story and it's the action and it's everything. But like, how does it? Do I feel what this movie feels like? Because um, I always try to remember that I'm not writing a script. I'm writing a movie. And do I have a sense of what this movie is ultimately going to feel like? Um, one of the things I do quite early on as I'm starting the process is um, I go through iTunes and buy a bunch of new songs and put them all together and put together the playlist up for songs that sound like my movie. And those won't be songs that will actually ever be in the movie, but they sort of remind me what that movie is that I think I'm writing is going to feel like. And so times where I get really stuck, you start to play that. And like, oh, okay, that's what this movie feels like. Um, or if I have to come back to a project that I've been gone for four months, um, it reminds me what that feels like. So. It's it's that initial process is just gathering together all the things that sort of feel like my movie, ripping things out of magazines, and um, just sort of building my nest in which I can write this movie. I've actually written the trailer for uh, yeah. I've, I've done I've done the same thing. It yeah. helps particularly for for originals and uh, when I'm trying to figure out a time when I, I I don't have a handle on it. It's a way of all right. It's kind of like with an annotation of a book. You go through and pick out what are what are your coolest moments. What is and <laughs> um, and just kind of gives you a tone together. too. Yeah, yeah a tone is a, is a crucial thing you're trying to find early on. Mm -hmm. There's your question. Hi, my question is to those who've adapted either from comics or from books with living authors. I just wondered how much interference you've found when you've written the script, because I read somewhere that in terms of Harry Potter with J.K. Rowling, you know, it's very controlling of the franchise and that I believe you might have to re reintroduce a house elf or a creature or, or take out things. So I just wondered ultimately how much interference have you had from the living authors of things that you've adapted? Um. Uh, well, I, I haven't had any. I mean, in, she was uh, anything but interfering. In fact, 
Um, I mean, she couldn't have been more supportive. And uh, there was, I think what you're talking about, there was one uh, uh, minor character who had been omitted in an early draft who, this is before the final books had come out, and she came back and said, you know, you might want to have him in there because he's going to be important later. <laughs> <laughs> and I, actually, I, he had, I, the, it was in uh, an early draft, and I just, I cut it out myself because it was sort of uh, superfluous, and so it was a matter of, you know, putting in a scene I'd, I'd written and, and cut. Um, I had a different experience on Contact because Carl Sagan was a producer of the movie, and um, and it was his baby, it was his story, it was his life. And so I felt, um, actually it was similar in that there was a great relief in being able to sort of serve somebody else's vision and, and, and with uh, Joe Rowling, you know, she created this amazing universe. So you could kind of um, subordinate your ego in a way and that's what everybody did on that film and it's kind of a part of what made it a great experience, I think. Um, and, and similarly with Carl because uh, it was so personal for him and, and and I think about him in a lot of ways and in ways he 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 might not have wanted to admit um, uh, but with Carl he was much more hands on and it was a really interesting experience um, because uh, he he ha he he started writing his book um, which was actually a treatment before it was a book with a theme in mind with an, an agenda and it was very much a a polemic. It was a, a you know science, you know, beats the pants off religion, and um, and it was an issue in the in the in the adaptation because um, it wasn't very dramatic. You know, we needed to to make a real um, dialectic, and um, so having that those conversations with him uh, um, and uh, became part of the actually stuff out of those conversations went into the film and and it was a it was uh, it really added to it so uh, I've, but I've never had I've never felt interfered with per se mm -hmm. I think more often than not they probably feel because apart from the really powerful writers these people have no they've sold it <laughs> you know they don't they can't um, and so I know sometimes I feel like I'm killing their baby because their book isn't the movie. It, ne it needs to be chopped into pieces and turned into, a, turned into a movie in order for me to do my job. And I know they're not going to like it. Um, I haven't met the guy. The one guy I know <laughs> must hate it. Uh, I haven't met. Uh, so it's a weird experience. But we also just wrote one with a perfectly lovely man who... Was nothing but supportive. So, yeah, Daniel Wallace, who wrote Big Fish, um, you know, had no sort of Hollywood experience at all, and had never read a screenplay until he read the screenplay of his mo of his book. And so, like, I think he thought that like, well, this is always what happens, and it's always like, a, you know, you know, a good experience. Um, he did describe it rather than like killing his children, like you know, he took my children and dressed them up in funny clothes, and, um, <laughs> and that's fair. And I did, and there were there were huge, huge changes made from his book. But his book was, his book is weird, and it didn't have a movie structure at all. And he sort of knew that and got that, and you know, he liked reading the script so much that he became a screenwriter. So that was a happy <laughs> outcome, I guess. He's a competitor now. Um, <laughs> that my bad experience though has been sort of when. The author is also a producer on the movie and has like uh, controls over things that, you know, like listen, it's going to be different and like there's you should be writing the movie yourself if that's the case and that's become one of those, you know, warning danger signs that like I probably will not take a project if the author is hugely powerful and or involved. Well, I noticed I once did a, an adaptation where the author was making noises, but the the producers all thought well. Make them a creative consultant. Uh, make them a producer. Give them, guarantee them a fee. And if it gets really difficult, they get fired. You know, in other words, they they are hired, so to speak, to be part of the production. But then there's a firewall built so that the production can proceed, and the person has a yeah. Uh, but kind of you as the writer, so you as writer, still end up having to deal with their crap for a long time. And you know, so you we want to pick the you know. Sometimes it's three or four or five years of your life, and you don't want those to be miserable. So you want to hopefully pick the projects that are 
going to be good experiences that are going to get made that are going to become good movies like there's a lot of criteria in there and just like there's certain directors you don't want to work with there's certain other situations you don't want to get into there's right. certain Morgan Creeks you're not rushing to work with again <laughs> yeah. we have time for one more question the gentleman in the hat there Hey guys, thanks for a great uh, Q and A. Um, can you just t talk briefly about your day-to-day pro -day process of writing, if that's changes with a big adaptation or a big genre type project? Great question. Did, did, does the does the wait a minute does the genre change your daily? Yeah, like if you're doing a lot of research or what, you know. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, how does your method shift Put from film pants to film? On if, you're <laughs> yeah. if it's science fiction, I have to wear that funny hat to get in the <laughs> mood. Um, uh, uh, it depends. It depends on, it is a really good question. If you have to do a lot of research, then, you know, if I do as much of that as I can as quickly as possible up front and, you know, and, and, and take, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a month, depending on what it is, and just, just learn all that so I can forget a lot about it and, you know, and, and kind of remember the stuff I need to. Uh, and then, you know, writing is just, God, I don't, I mean, everybody, I, I don't know what, what you guys are like, but I, I like to work and I get up at seven and work till about four. Um, but, but, uh, cause I'm just no good after that, um, unless I'm taking lots of coffee, but, uh, uh, I like to work in the morning and, um, and then, and then no matter, you know, you have to really be careful, be careful how, wh what high school is like if you ever were, I, I crammed for tests mm -hmm. and so no matter how long I have, it's like, I always want another week and then the last four days I'm, I'm like sleeping two hours a night and, uh, and then just like okay here you know yeah and then go crash for a week well, well I always have to turn in stuff to Chris so uh, you know there's it there's there's a bit of a seriously there's a little bit of a schedule involved when you have somebody else you know that you're you know that is counting on you to right. turn your pages because we read our scenes separately initially right. Yeah, I mean, just, just briefly, ours is three parts, so we'll outline the heck out of it, and that'll take as long as it takes, weeks and weeks, and then eventually someone will prove that, whoever the powers that be say, that's a good outline, and then we'll split it up. And so he'll take one through six, and I'll take seven through 12, and we'll go away for a week, and we'll come back, and we'll put them together, and we'll read it, and we won't touch it, and we'll assign the next, you know, week's work. And then so after, I don't know, six, seven weeks, we've got this big, ugly Frankenstein of a draft that is repetitive and boring and really, really long. And then, then the third part is rewriting that. And that's both of us in the same room, uh, getting in and out of the chair and, uh, you know, rewriting each other's stuff. And sometimes we're in different rooms on different computers and, and like that. And that's sort of where you really earn your money. Uh, I, uh, I spent most of my day spent avoiding writing. But, um, <laughs> seriously, uh, I think it's 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 evolved over the years, and I think it's different for everybody. And a big part of learning how to write is learning what process works for you. Um, and for me, it's uh, uh, I usually I like to write in the morning too. Um, usually, uh, I have a certain clarity then. Um, and when I'm starting out, I'll, I, you know. Just sort of if something's brewing. I'll just think about it, and for most of the process, if I get like three or four hours in, that's a really good day. Because um, beyond that, I'm you know I may do some some rewriting or reading, but usually it's just kind of I'm exhausted after that. And except for that last week when you're just and I think there's something about the energy of that and and, yeah. and the, the yeah, panic the of that yeah that um, you get into a kind of flow state and. and uh, Kind of kick it up to the next level, but um, uh, and that's yeah. That that was something that I was I, I felt guilty for a long time. It's like God, I'm only writing for like three or four hours, and then I you know after talking to a lot of other writers, it seemed to be fairly common. But you, I feel guilty looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know sometimes and uh, sometimes not writing is writing. Yeah. I mean you know I uh, that's, uh, I. Uh, I'll go. I have like a sort of garden area, and um, I'm, and if I if I'm thinking about stuff, I'm I'm working on that. But my my brain's turning, and 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 there are times when if you're just if you're if you're if you're not hitting the keys, but sitting in front of your computer, mm -hmm. it it kind of kills. You know, it's like I, you got to get up and walk around. You got to go yeah. do something. Yeah, I mean, like I'll only write. F 
the time that's what kills me at the end of the week if i could only spend the time it actually took me to type the words out i could do the week's work in about half a day um but it takes me 10 hours to do three hours of work because one i have the attention span of a chipmunk um but it's also that it just doesn't come very quickly so you wind up wandering around the house and doing the dishes a lot or googling yeah. mm, googling um for for first drafts i tend to go off someplace and barricade myself and so i'll i'll get a hotel room in some place that is interesting enough that like I, I can stand to be there but not so interesting that i'll actually want to do other stuff and uh I'll just hand write as much as I possibly can, and because um, there's that there's that moment where you're just like in love with a project and you just you just can't have enough of it, or you're infatuated with it, and so I try to use that to sort of like crank through as much as I possibly can, and I'll hand write so that I can't go back and edit and sort of and rewrite it and fix it. Um, and there've been times where I've been able to get like 60 or 65 pages out of that sort of that three or four days of sort of barricading, and that's great because then I've had enough momentum that I can finish things. Um, at times that I haven't done that, it's it's a lot harder slog, and just like because you end up sort of typing those first ten pages and rewriting those t first ten pages a lot, and they they're great, but you're not writing anything further. Um, what does change in sort of genre-wise is that there's definitely I can tell whether I'm funny or I'm not funny at the moment, and if I have to write comedy, um, and I get hired to do comedy sometimes. Uh, I just, sometimes I'm just not funny at all, and so I can almost always write like that action sequence, or I can write the other drama, or, or sort of you know people having to talk to each other. I can do that, but there's times where I'm just not funny, and to try to force funny is you're going to get jokeoids, which are things that sort of look like jokes but are actually not funny, <laughs> and, uh, and those are dangerous because like well it feels like a joke, yeah. and, and it's hard to sort of kill those and and fix them. So do you write? Out of sequence all the time. I write out of sequence all the time. I'll write whatever scene appeals to me right at the time. And if I don't have the energy to write that thing, I'll write the thing that I actually do know how to write. Or if I don't kind of know what happens in that scene, but I know what happens four scenes down the road, I'll write that instead. I start up with a, uh, uh, I call it like a scriptment, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, and it it, it, end, it it's the I only really have one document, yeah. and it starts out as like the four things that I think might be cool, and then you know you just keep adding stuff and it expands and grows and grows and grows and so you know it, it, it's just it's an outline that becomes 120 pages so many weeks later yeah I, I do that sometimes it's just dangerous for me to sort of like it's just so easy to keep rewriting the scenes I've rewritten that I, I won't write the new scenes unless it's, it's actually a new document I'm just doing this one thing that has to happen so I can see both yeah. you guys have been great uh, these are wonderful answers and you guys have been great too what great questions thank you